So um, I'm very pleased to have uh, Jürgen together with, uh, with me to, um, to chair this and to make your life uh, miserable in uh, your effort to uh, make it on time. So the first speaker, so I'll, I'll, we, have, uh, we have two groups of speakers, the ones that will present online, those who will present um, uh, with physical presence. So I would uh, please ask the, phys the speakers that will present um, with physical presence to stand here, sit comfortable, um, these chairs. Okay. Okay, so the first speaker is going to be uh, Arnab Ghosh from the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics in India. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm Orno from National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, and I'm quickly uh, will give you a tour of uh, genomic narrative of the progression of a precancerous lesion to uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, uh, oral cancer is a major problem in India due to very high tobacco consumption rate. And uh, we need to particularly understand the genomic narrative of the progression because uh, to, to detect it uh, in an in a early stage. So uh, we asked uh, two major questions, which are, which are the, what are the molecular changes that occur in a precancerous lesion such as leukoplakia and what are the additional changes that occur within the tumor and as well as to understand what are the shift of the molecular uh, nature of the microenvironment from the normal to precancerous lesion to tumor. And to, uh, in order to track that evolution, uh, we uh, specifically selected such oral cancer patients who have additional leukoplakia patches in addition to their tumors. And we have collected samples from tumor leukoplakia, this is normal and blood from all of these individuals and performed DNA and RNA sequencing. And we see there was a substantial amount of sharing of somatic mutations between the two compartments, the precancer and cancer. And the frequently mutated gene was caspasate. And we show that this caspasate was the early event during uh, in a precancerous lesion. And it facilitates the intraepithelial cell migration. And we show that the tumors gained additional hits in other, uh, other tumor driver genes. And uh, we also show that uh, it, it, was, it was evolving immune dynamics that was uh, the depletion of the anti-tumor tumor, anti -tumor immune cells in the tumor in, from the normal to precancer to tumor. And also we show that uh, the early mutations that occurred in a precancerous lesion, uh, those are uh, immune sup suppressive in nature. Yeah, thank you. Which one you use this one? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce the second speaker, and I'm going to apologize to all of our speakers. If I mispronounce your names, I apologize. Please teach me how to pronounce your name. Our second speaker is Alpha Messaoud from the Institut Pasteur in Tunis and the University Tunis El Mana in Tunisia. Thank you, Jurgen. Can we start? So it's my pleasure to. Uh, why? <laughs> Could you please come uh, count again? Okay. Yes. It's my pleasure to introduce or to uh, share with you our story, our journey during the last 20 years in using indirect genotyping techniques. So Tunisia is the one of the most ethnic population. Its genetic uh, landscape is characterized by the presence of founder genetic variants, as it is the case of the xeroderma pigmentosome, so sharing a common genetic background with other North African countries made it easier for our findings to have this regional impact. 
Using uh, indirect genotyping tools is not only valuable for low and middle income countries, but when it comes to national screening programs, it's also useful for rich countries. So we started our journey with a linkage analysis by means of microsatellite homozygous mapping. Despite showing founder effect, uh, the lack of information in certain families was behind abandoning these techniques. Then we moved to a restriction fragment length polymorphism. This technique was uh, time consuming and uh, limited to a certain number of variants, so we left it aside. Then we used also allele specific oligonucleotide. Despite being cost and time effective, this technique was limited to certain variants and not with enough sensitivity. We used also high resolution melting, which was reliable for substitution, but not for deletions and insertions. A variant of Azu was used also, which is called Caspar. This technique was with mild, middle throughput, reliable, but limited only to uh, approved variants. We introduced graphene oxide, uh, an advanced material, sorry, to increase the sensitivity of Azu. With this technique, we were able not only to reduce the technical complexity, but also the time by three and the cost by five. Last year, we developed a new biosensor. We patented it. It has unique properties. And this year, we were working on this biosensor with this biosensor to target DNA and use uh, to develop new uh, molecular biology techniques, that, especially for genotyping. And it's time. Thank you. My time is done, but the journey is continuing. It is quite difficult, as you can see. Imagine how it was with one minute. So, next speaker is going to be uh, Rim Hamad. No? Uh, so, Vindia Subashinge, uh, Birmingham Women's and Children's NHS Foundation, UK. Um, <coughs> Hello, everyone. Um, actually, I'm uh, presenting my research work from Sri Lanka. Uh, the topic is. Um, Phenotype genotype correlation of chromosome 22 Q11 deletion, uh, clues for uh, better clinical suspicion in resource limited setting. Um, so, uh, chromosome 22 Q11 is the most common deletion syndrome uh, in humans. Uh, so, the deletion in this particular critical region is uh, categorized as proximal, central, and distal deletions. So, the aim of our study was to describe the phenotype genotype correlation in Sri Lankan children. Uh, so we recruited 16 uh, children with uh, clinical suspicion of 22Q11 deletion. Um, and their uh, phenotype was uh, 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 detailed clinical uh, history examination and investigations were documented and the genotyping was done by MLPA uh, targeting the critical region 22Q11.2. And in results, uh, we identified six patients with the deletions, and all of them had proximal deletions. And the interesting finding was uh, the congenital heart disease and certain dysmorphic features were consistent in all the patients with deletions. That, uh, to highlight the dysmorphic features, it was the prominent nose with squared nasal root and the uh, uh, abnormally folded ears. So in conclusion, uh, I, we would like to emphasize the importance of clinical examination uh, in uh, children with the congenital heart disease before we order genetic testing uh, to um, uh, utilize the resources uh, for a better clinical uh, confirmation in resource limited setting. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Linia Nanjagi from University of Nairobi and the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry about that. Right, so good morning. I'm Dr. Linia Nanjagi from Kenya Medical Research Institute in Kenya. Um, and uh, I also work at the University of Nairobi. So the work I'm going to present today is on pharmacogenomics guided TB therapy. And the first question I'll ask is, what will it really take to end TB? Um, have we really all thought about that even as we talk about end of TB? 
Uh, as we know, treatment has been available for a decade, uh, but TB has remained a leading cause of mortality and morbidity uh, generally. And isoniazid is one of the drugs that is, has been used for decades and it works. We know it's effective. It has good bactericidal activity, but there have been uh, reports of limited effectiveness, um, as we know. And one of the thoughts are the pharmacokinetic variability due to the single nucleotide polymorphisms of the NAT2 gene. Um, what we have known, um, for example, in Kenya and many other African populations is that most people are said to be slow acetylators, but is that really the case? And the next question I'll ask is, should we really be doing weight-based dosing? As you know, the WHO guidelines and our own local guidelines talk about weight-based dosing, but is that what we should really be doing? So towards pharmacogenomics guided therapy, um, in a small group, in a large HIV program, we got 79 volunteers who are willing to be uh, genotyped, use the Sanger sequencing method, and um, we uh, derived the phenotypes. And what we found was that 76% of the participants were rapid acetylators, which is different from what is known, that most are slow acetylators. And so, could this be the reason we have some drug resistance um, despite working chemotherapy? And so I suggest to you that it's time to start doing pharmacogenomic guided TB therapy and pharmacogenomic guided therapy for other infectious diseases. So thank you. Well done. Uh, next one, uh, Chantal Delong from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. So our study focused on imatinib resistance um, and evaluating the pharmacogenetic variability in the South African CML cohort. So drug resistance are often associated with poor um, patient outcomes, and we used um, chronic myeloid leukemia or CML as a disease model to investigate why 20 to 30 percent of these patients become resistant to imatinib, the frontline drug used. So pharmacogenetics can um, explain the drug variability due to the um, presence of single nucleotide variants or SNBs. So we aim to evaluate these SNPs located within um, on the screen within these candidate genes that encode selected drug transporters effect on imatinib response. So a maximum of 45 imatinib resistant and 44 imatinib non-resistant patients were analyzed. So briefly for the um, methodology, um, following DNA extractions, either allele-specific restriction enzyme analysis was performed, Sanger sequencing, or Tachman assays were performed. So we inferred three things from the study, and I will discuss the results and discussion for the sake of time together. So number one, all SMVs were found to be statistically insignificant when comparing the two groups. Thus, no SMVs were found to affect the Martin response in our cohort. Secondly, an interesting finding of SMV deletion G was linked to poor Martin response by Johanna Gist um, et al. 2013. However, the simultaneous presence of SMV M48V circumvented this effect. So all patients in our cohort had both um, SMVs. Thus, we don't expect the Martin uptake to be affected. Lastly, they observed genotype frequencies um, for SMVs were in line with the expected genotype frequencies, except for the SMVs that are listed on the screen. And furthermore, we observed that these SMVs allele frequencies align to either both one or none of the global and um, African allele frequencies. The differences could possibly... <laughs> So um, I'm going to, again, start with an apology. If I mispronounce your name, I'm sure you'll teach me how to pronounce it correctly. Waruni Nawagamawa is our next speaker. She's from the University of Colombo in Sri Lanka. Good morning, everyone. Uh, <coughs> my, study, uh, my study is a genetic uh, study on genetic variant associated with sarcoidosis in Sri Lankan population. Uh, sarcoidosis is a granulomatous inflammatory disease with unknown etiology. Mm, it is hypothesized that that is um, that will and that is a combination of genetic and environmental factor, factors will be affected, and uh, ma mainly mainly affected organs are uh, lungs, uh, skin, lungs, skin, and eyes. 
liver and eyes. Apart from that, uh, all other organs and uh, systems can can be affected. In some case, in various level that can be affected. In some cases, uh, all um, all the system can be uh, permanently impaired. Okay, uh, my objective was to determine a genetic variant associated with, sarco uh, associated with the patient affected with sarcoidosis in the Sri Lankan population. Now, th this was my methodology. First, I did the uh, wide literature search uh, globally, and then I uh, filtered them into uh, South Asian and Asian cont continent. And then uh, when I was doing a literature search, majority li majority of lit researchers was uh, researchers were uh, epidemiology studies, not in uh, genetic studies. Uh, when you consider uh, Asian context, so it's South Asian context, uh, there were very less uh, amount of research has done. Uh, research has been done on um, uh, genetic study of in sarcoidosis in the Sri Lanka. This was the first genetic study about sarcoidosis, genetics of sarcoidosis. Uh, I did the literature search and then I decided the primers uh, by using bioinformatic tools. Then I, while I am doing those stuff, uh, I collected the sample and DNA extraction was done. Uh, DNA quantification and then uh, optimization uh, got uh, nearly six uh, six months. And then uh, I put the PCR and then agarose gel, while uh, it, I got the results from ag agarose gel electrophoresis. <laughs> Finally, I, I validated the results by Sanger sequencing. 20% of the patient got uh, heterozygous mutant. So uh, my suggestion is to explore more genetic variant by using Sanger sequencing. <laughs> Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present here. Thank you. OK. Uh, so the next uh, speaker is going to present uh, virtually, and that's Michaela Barbieri-Kennedy from Argentina. She won't. So the next one is going to be uh, Miss Grace Larby Gaffa from African Kidney Disease Research Network, the University of Ghana Medical School in Ghana. Good morning. So I'm presenting on participants and stakeholders' views on feedback of genetic research findings in Ghana. So the AIDS Fabrica Kidney Disease Research Network has been carrying out, sorry, the, the SDF Fabrica Kidney Disease Research Network in Ghana carried out a, research, a case control research in Ghanaians and Nigerians, which shows that 28.2% of the study population carry two APOL1 IRS variants. And it's also known that relatives of participants with APOL1 mediated kidney disease may be at risk of increasing of maybe at increased risk of developing kidney disease. But the AIDS Fabrica Kidney Disease Research Network did not seek permission from participants to feedback such findings. So the question was whether to feedback such findings to participants and their relatives or not. So there, this research was carried out to find out the views of the research participants, their families, ethics review board members, and then the researchers themselves on whether to feedback such findings or not. So for the results, so participants and their families want genetic research findings to be returned to them. As quoted, it will be good to know what is happening to me as an individual and the community around me. So I think it would be good to return genetic results to everyone involved. This a statement from a participant. So in conclusion, we say that it is very important, it's ethically important to return validated, clinically relevant individual results to genetic research uh, participants and their families. And I will recommend that the Kidney Disease Research Network explore innovative ways, not just to share the results to participants, but also to uh, the communities as well. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharifa Isaacs from Stellenbosch University in South Africa.
Inherited thrombophilia is a multiple gene disorder with high mortality and morbidity. For this study, we focus specifically on the coagulation factors um, 2 and 5, which is the G1601A and the 20210A specifically. So we conducted a retrospective order audit over a 15-year period from 2007 to 2021 and investigated the test um, frequencies, the test request frequencies and the frequency of mutations. Okay, so a total of 915 molecular um, diagnostic tests were requested over a 15-year period with 83% being for, factor, for the factor 5 Leiden assay, 13 were for both of the assays simultaneously, and 4% was for factor 2. We then looked at the mutation rate per assay and found a frequency of 7.1% for factor 2 and only 3% for factor um, 5. So from 2007 to 2012, a little specific PCR was used where one gene is tested per assay. But during 2013, a multiplex assay was implemented, which is the expert factor 2 and factor 5 Leiden test by SEPID, where both genes would be screened simultaneously. So both results would be available, but only one, the only one test is only the test result requested by the clinicians would be released. The lab would then advise the clinician to request a second test, and interestingly, majority of the fact two positive cases that were identified were second requests. Other interesting findings were that our younger patient presented at least than two years of age, and one of our patients presented with both of the factor two and factor five mutations. Our data suggests that factor two is being undertested, that our cohorts present at a younger age compared, compared to glo the global stats, and that site-specific guidelines is essential in our setting. Thank you so much. So the next speaker is going to be uh, Satushika Arumaina Yaham from uh, the University of Colombo in Sri Lanka. So while we're sorting out the technical issues, um, we're going to go to the next speaker, which is Youssef El Kadiri from the National Institute of Health of Rabat in Morocco. Hello, I'm Youssef El Kadiri. I'm from Morocco. I'm PhD in human genetics and molecular biology at the Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacy in Rabat and the Department of Medical Genetics at the National Institute of Health. Before starting this presentation, I would like to thank the Scientific Committee for the organization of this conference and also for giving me this opportunity to present and to share with you my research work entitled Genetic and Molecular Study of Congenital Myopathies and Congenital Muscular Dystrophies in Morocco. For the introduction, you know that congenital muscular dystrophies and congenital myopathies are clinically and genetically heterogeneous groups of neuromuscular disorders. In our context, there are very few genetic studies on these conditions, 
which explains the absence of molecular epidemiology data for this disease. This is the reason why this research work focused on these neuromuscular disorders. In line with the international bioethics rules, we investigated 22 Moroccan families who referred to our department after clinical assessment by pediatric evaluation. All these patients were met our inclusion criteria. Firstly, genetic analysis in the province was conducted by next generation sequencing technology using two approaches, targeted NGS gene panel, clinical exam sequencing with local bioinformatics analysis in our lab. In this study, we identified 17 variants harbored in 18 unrelated patients that were genetically resolved. Five among 17 variants are novel. Additionally, we expanded the phenotypic spectrum of unknown heterozygous LMNA variants and we reported it for the first time to a form of CMD. Here, five different conditions of Fair is fair. So, one more time, Shatsushika, um, Arumaina uh, Yaham. One more try. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be presenting my abstract on designing and implementation of TMS PCR assay, the genotype genetic variant associated with retinoblastoma in a cohort of Sri Lankan population. Retinoblastoma is an intraocular malignancy, which normally occurs in children below 5 years. So according to my study, the RB1 gene is the most commonest gene, which is significantly associated with the disease in Sri Lankan population. And this is the molecular basis of retinoblastoma with unilateral condition and bilateral condition, and how it gets affected to form a malignant phenotype is shown here. The objective is to conduct a comprehensive literature search through global search and Asian population and to analyze the allele frequency of the selected variant in the Sri Lankan population and to design and implement a novel genetic assay to identify the genetic variants in Sri Lankan population. The first step primary designing was done throughout this process and these are the variants were selected throughout this primary designing. The methodology was the first DNA extraction and quantification, PCR protocol optimization, Tetram's PCR method was used to amplify the PCR product. Agarose gel electrophoresis was performed to visualize the PCR product. The results were homozygous wild type for, all, uh, for both variants for all 59 samples. The demographic data analysis is 60% um, of the sample had unilateral condition, 40% of the samples had bilateral condition. When it comes to family history, Four patients had positive family history, out of which two patients with unilateral and two patients with bilateral. Discussion. Why the disease is mainly developed in Asian countries because of low social economical factors and lack of awareness of, awareness of the disease are the reasons of it. Conclusion. This assay can be introduced as a sensitive, specific and simple diagnostic technique for screening related genetic variant for retinoblastoma in Sri Lankan population. Thank you. So um, I guess we can have an informal discussion after we uh, finish here, and uh, that's all going to be over the posters uh, with coffee break. Just a general remark. Um, uh, it may seem uh, swift, but you can accommodate anything you want to say within two minutes, even one minute. It's called pitching, and some of you will be asked to pitch your idea, not necessarily in front of academics, but also in front of uh, venture capitalists if someone wishes to pursue the corporate uh, avenue. Um, keep in mind that whenever you present, uh, the golden rule is one slide per minute and make sure not to make it too busy. So for example, maintain the font size from 24 and above. Otherwise the slides will be very, very busy. And try to convey the message by emphasizing, um, uh, in fact, key points from the slide that you want to uh, highlight. So congrats to all. Uh, sorry for being harsh, that's our job. Um, and uh, we'll see you all outside for a break. Thank you.